Good evening. It's Wednesday night at 9 p.m. This is the Whatnot Podcast, where we put the what into whatnot. I'm Mike Z. I'm Chris, and I put the Chris into the Whatnot Podcast. And joined with us this evening is Jess Crow of Crow Creek Designs. How are you doing this evening? I'm doing good. How are you? Doing fine. Doing fine. So um, we'll get started with telling a little bit about who you are, what you do, why you're on the podcast per se, and we'll go from there. All right. So who am I? I don't know. I actually ask myself that like probably 10 times a day. Who am I? So for the purpose of ease, uh, Jess Crow, I'm up here in very crazy Alaska where we've alternated between uh, 20 inches of snow to 20 inches of rain yesterday. And I like to say that I don't have like a box that I fit into, but I think most people associate me now with epoxy and epoxy work. Whereas I've done everything from, um, in my previous lifetime, uh, beading, like we're talking huge, intricate, Egyptian-style beaded collars, to uh, woodworking, building, painting, drawing. Cool. Nice. And I think that's one of the reasons why we were excited about having you on, is you, you don't just do epoxy, you do oh, so much more. And you bring a lot to the table and a lot to discussion. So we were excited when you said, yeah, we couldn't believe that you actually said, yeah, we'll come on and do that. So it's like, oh, wait, are you sure about that? <laughs> are we sure about that? I was more or less thinking, oh my gosh, they want me. This is so cool. Let's do this. Well, I know. I, don't know. That, uh, I think it's such an interesting concept. Like, do people say no to you? Yes. Do they, are, really? Yeah. <laughs> He's a scheduling guy. He would know. I don't know. Yeah. Is it? And see, I know you're supposed to be asking me questions, but I'm always learning, right? Oh, no. Yeah. So for me, even if you've got only five people that are watching, that's maybe five people who didn't know about me before and five people that I want to know about. So, I mean, aside from a scheduling conflict, I, I guess it's fascinating to me that you're gauged by your audience side versus what I would learn from you guys. I think there's that. And then there's also the idea that a podcast, you know, a lot of times when you're, when you're listening to them, um, you know, sometimes the interviews can be kind of persuade to where they want to try to get something out of you that no one else knows, or they're trying to find out some sort of dirt or something like that. And the reason Chris and I started this is because when the whole lockdown thing happened, we, we talked woodworking, we'd be on social media and be like, Oh man, do you see what they did? Do you see how this happened? You know, blah, blah, blah. And when we couldn't do that face to face in the office, we were like, well, why don't we just do a podcast and just talk about woodworking? Then it evolved into why don't we have guests on that we enjoy and find out more about them. So I think a lot of times people are kind of scared of the conversation, if you will. You know, it's just talking about your craft. I don't we never figured out why that's a bad thing, but it is what it is. Yeah. Humans are weird. I hate to break the news to you. Yeah. I'm used to rejection, though, so it works OK. <laughs> hey, look, at, there is Donovan. Is there an echo? Only if only if Donovan's watching my uh, loops of videos that he had to deal with. Yep, Donovan is now. And who is Donovan to you again? So uh, he is my new uh, video editor. Is his official title to me? He's more like my magic man, right? Because he did my last YouTube video that I just put up, and my kids watched it for the first time, and they're like, "Why would he make more of you? Because one is bad enough." <laughs> Uh, kids are so honest. <laughs> yeah. So uh, Donovan and I, we, we've actually not like met met in person. I think it'll be really embarrassing if you'd be like, we've met like six times, Jess. Thanks for remembering me. Um, but he was a teacher at Workbench, and he's going to be, I think, hosting a class at the upcoming Workbench, too, here in February as well. Very cool. Let's see. Magic Man is now my official job title. Yeah, see, there we go. <laughs> <laughs> magic man <laughs> he's got this figure not out. to be confused with magic mike there you go donovan you had the wrong first name sorry bud well i'm gonna leave that one alone i've never even seen that movie have you no I, that was such a dirty look see here you guys thought this was gonna be so good you're gonna be like we're gonna have jess on here we're gonna talk about epoxy and you're getting drilled and one of you's turning red oh who's turning red is it me gosh yes. no i've never seen magic mike i get the idea Okay. <laughs> it's not for me, though. Uh, so, I was okay. an extra in the movie, so I didn't get to watch it, though. Oh, oh, were, you the, oh, that were you a server? Yeah. Yeah. 
I was the before photo. Oh, there you go. You were the inspiration of why they decided to work out for yeah. 30 days. I got yeah. it. I saw a meme about the Magic Mike and Shrek. It was like, ladies, if you think or if you think dad bods are in style, uh, and had like how much Magic Mike's gross. And the response that somebody had was like, yeah, well, Shrek grossed. And Shrek grossed like three times as much. So it was the comparison oh, of what smart, women right? want. Women want Shrek. Just, women just get Shrek. that off. The, women want Shrek. Just, you know, onions, layers, the whole dad bod thing. Go for it. Go for it. Well, let's see. Um, actually, I'm going to ask a question real quick, and I know you've covered this on other podcasts, but the rings on your fingers. Yes. Yes. What Both. are those for? Uh, so I have what's called Ehlers-Danlos. And uh, Ehlers-Danlos is a rare genetic disease. Ehlers-Danlos is a connective tissue and collagen uh, production problem. So... I do not make collagen and connective tissue like uh, you guys do, unless you have Ehlers-Danlos, and we all don't make it, or we make it very poorly. So the rings on my fingers are actually splints. Um, so oftentimes you don't see, I know you guys can see them here, but people who are just going to be listening to this aren't going to see that they create a cross where my finger bends, and that prevents my finger from hyperflexing up, so it, it stops. These are actually called swan splints, is the official term. And uh, without them, my fingers can dislocate um, pretty easily. So, for instance, when I'm working on the lathe, you know, the safety police come out in droves and hammer me for having my rings on. But the fact is, is I cannot do lathe work without my rings. I actually can't even really write without them on because my fingers would, would uh, bend like a, a piece of licorice. And you have to hold the pen, you know, like you're a toddler learning how to scribble. So uh, Ehlers Danlos is actually a big part of my platform because I feel that with over 60 million disabled people in the United States alone, and of that percentage of people, um, over 80% of them have a skill or hobby that they are no longer able to attain or work towards a goal to because particularly their shop spaces don't fit them. So I'm a huge advocate of making your shop space fit you instead of you having to fit your shop space. Um, and real quickly, even before we move on to that super short story, when I was learning how to weld, I, I had uh, the best teachers in the world. It was at a Lincoln event. It was a uh, Maker Summer School. Or, well, no, that was the name that it transpired into. But Craig Coffey was the one who was putting it on. And it was uh, in Cleveland. And the late, great uh, Jesse Combs, fastest woman in the world, she was there teaching as well as a gentleman named J JD. And he goes by Apex. On, uh, on Instagram and Facebook, mm -hmm. he was trying to teach me how to weld. And he's he's an amazing teacher. But I uh, I was kind of a little too, it was one of the rare occasions that I wasn't uh, being forthright, that my hands were struggling to hold the welder and keep the bead. Jesse, she came up and uh, she's like, what's, you know, what's going on here? And I was like, well, I just, I just can't keep my hands straight. So she... She asked what the problem was, told her my hand strength isn't really good. I got neuropathy, my handshake. She tossed the hoses over my shoulder, said, now try it. That was when it dawned on me that why am I constantly trying to fit my shop? Why am I constantly trying to fit my tools? All I had to do was take those hoses, toss them over my shoulder, and JD was able to teach me how to weld like a freaking master. But it didn't dawn on me to make my tools fit me. I figured I had to keep conforming to them. So rings, whole nine yards. My choices, where my rings or not lathe, I'm going to wear my rings and figure out how to make the lathe work for me and how to be safe about it. There you go. You know, a question for the lathe is, do you have to have a certain set of tools like carbide tools or high speed steel? Does it matter or the handle or anything like that? Um, I would have to say that for me, as I'm still very much a beginner in learning, it has been more imperative to learn proper body position and proper use of the, any tool because uh, for those who haven't done lathe work, you know, you see a video and you think it's basically just drawing the knife into it and it's all about the knife cutting into the wood, whereas it's all about your body dynamics and how you're approaching the wood that makes for a good cut. There's actually not a lot of pressure needed, to, you know, when you've got good tooling. Mm -hmm. So the answer isn't as clear as carbide versus steel as much as it is and was learning how to position my body to 
to where the weight was more or less coming from the proper stance versus me like stabbing it. Right. Proper technique. Proper technique. Uh, one of the original whatnoters, Mr. Kyle Ely. Good evening. Yeah, he's uh, if you if if you get into more CNC work with your Laguna, and we'll and we'll ask you about the Laguna lathes or the Laguna shop stuff that you got. You got the laser, the CNC, and what else? That way, I've got uh, the Laguna EX laser. I have the Laguna four x four Swift, and I have the Laguna Revo eighteen thirty six uh, lathe. Oh, Donovan asked a good question. With all of the, as much as you travel, how many frequent flyer miles do you have? Uh, last I checked, 512,000. Wow. <laughs> Chris is now <laughs> taking donations. <laughs> I honestly, it is because I haven't used them in two years, in all transparency. And here's the deal. Um, when my girls were at home, we started this family tradition of going to uh, Maui. So for me, Maui is a direct five-hour flight. Super easy. So we used to always go there for Thanksgiving pre-pandemic. Uh, then 2020 happened, right? So we actually haven't got to do that for a couple of years. So I've been stockpiling the miles because the tradition is, is that the parent pays for the ticket. So I have three girls who now have decided one is now engaged. One has had a boyfriend for four years and one is determined now to get a boyfriend or a girlfriend. And so that means that uh, now I've got to pay for for six humans to come with me. So I need all those freaking miles. Yeah, they're going to they're gonna dwindle pretty quick. <laughs> yes. Good, Good evening, evening, Mr. Houston. So, uh, yeah, Mr. Uh, Kyle, uh, what Michael was saying earlier, he is the expert in all things Vectric. Oh, so goodness. when you get ready to start rocking on the CNC, he is the guy you want to talk to. And it's, it's, it's interesting and both dynamic to me. It tells me that I need to continue to broaden. So this is actually my second CNC. I have been working on a CNC now for almost four years. I just don't, I guess, probably post that as much as uh, other people do who are strictly CNC. Now, not that I couldn't use help because trust me, I built a flat pack table that makes epoxy work super easy. And that thing took me like a month of freaking design because I'm not a CNC wizard. I can get by, but uh, the CNC is an actual integral part of my business. Interesting. She's not just for pretty looks. She's not like the treadmill in my house. Mine was like just for collecting clothes. Yeah. <laughs> uh, well, Chris, what do you got? Questions, comments, concerns? So we'll, we'll lean it down uh, some of the other avenues other than just epoxy. I'm sure we'll cover that. But um, you do some intricate, you were talking about some of the intricate other work you've done. I mean, you did some like, do some pottery or something too, wasn't it? Uh, so I would have to, if, if, if I knew we were going to do that, I would have brought one of my pieces out. Uh, the Ehlers Danlos, and this, this ties together really nicely in a nice package. Um, Ehlers Danlos is a genetic condition, and my youngest daughter actually has it. And my youngest daughter spent uh, the first 10 years of her life actually in the hospital. Um, it was very, uh, it, it was a very long battle. Actually, uh, the physicians, her diagnosis is actually what led to my diagnosis. She wasn't expected actually to live past her 10th birthday. And we spent a lot of time traveling between Alaska and Seattle Children's. Finally, uh, going to Cincinnati Children's three times before a doctor there was able to come up with a diagnosis for her. In that meantime, I needed, uh, you know, it's really hard to work when, you, you know, you're you're constantly in the hospital. And I had two older children as well. So I, I've i always picked up things very quickly. Uh, and I saw a beading magazine one day, and she wanted a dragonfly out of it, my youngest. So I made her a dragonfly, stuff from Joanne Fabrics. And I also discovered that you can do a lot of easy beadwork in a hospital room. So that was actually what I did as one of my first gateways into being kind of an entrepreneur was uh, I submitted some some beadwork I did to a large bead magazine. It's called Bead and Button. It's like the fine woodworking magazine of the beadwork industry. And then they wanted articles and then they did publications on my work. Uh, and then all of a sudden I had clients all across the country. Uh, most gentlemen are familiar with Savorsky because of their scopes. 
um, most women are familiar with Swarovski because of the crystals. Uh, you know, like Victoria's Secrets chicks, they always wear Swarovski beaded stuff on them. And then really fine scopes, hunting scopes are made from Swarovski as well. Uh, their headquarters actually has two of my pieces. Cool. They're just weird, like, just facts. Like, I love super duper teeny tiny little beads making entire scenes on your necklace. Just gifted and artistic, that's for sure. My brain never stops. Oh, thanks, Kyle. Yep, Kyle says he loves your work, Jess. Been following you on IG for years. Much appreciated. So yeah, I just like doing stuff. I mean, I do. I just, I wish I knew how to slow down. I, that was something I wish I knew how to do. I do not know how to slow down. For all the things that I do know how to do, I do not know how to slow down. That's, that's a good problem to have. Yeah. Yeah. Keeps I, you from rusting that way, though. It does keep you from rusting, but I will I will be honest. It, it also makes it hard to have, um, like, idle time, right? Like, if your brain never shuts down because you're constantly thinking of the next thing that you can do, it, it does make it hard to find a quiet space. Yeah, I can see that. Yeah, that does make sense because you do also have to reset after certain things now when you do a big job like we'll get into the where i found out about you was that cocosquin no i said it wrong the Cusco river cuscoquim cuscoquim i'll get it one time eventually that's right i pronounced kyle's name his last name wrong for i don't know probably what six podcasts for christmas fine like hey by the way it's ely not eli i was like oh okay great don't so, ask so, me to say because i have to phonically Jeremy. Jeremy's a tough one. Jeremy. Oh, okay. <laughs> Sounds yeah. So pronunciations, not my thing. So you can call it whatever you want, but it is the Cuscoquin. It is the lower Cuscoquin. Well, let's talk about that real quick while we're here. But um, this table is a lot. It was twenty-five feet. Twenty-five feet. Yep. And, and as you can tell, I may have stolen these off of Instagram. I'm not going to say hey. I didn't. But what as far else as is I knew, Instagram for, but for stealing? Well, I mean, I at least told you about it. <laughs> I was like, how am I going to get these pictures from her? So tell us about this table. Where does it sit right now? So uh, that is actually downtown Anchorage. You can kind of, see, well, it's midtown Anchorage. You can see it in the back there. And that is on the third floor of uh, a building of a corporation. And that sits in the Kuskokwim uh, Native Corporation's office. That thing, um, wow. So if, you, if, you're, if your viewers were looking at that picture, right in the center of the table, there's uh, the speaker. But it, you can also kind of look like there might be a seam. So that table was originally designed to be a solid 25-foot section. So we actually went over that in depth. Do we want to do it in two 12-and-a-half-foot sections, easier to maintain, easier to manage? But they were going to actually remove panes from that window and have it craned up. Well, unfortunately, uh, in Alaska, everything's about a thousand times more expensive. And after the build was all finished, we were talking to the crane company, the whole nine yards getting ready to uh, plan the move from where my shop was to that office location. And the uh, board was not able to justify the cost of taking a window out, renting a crane, the whole nine yards. So the message I get is, we're going to need you to cut it in half. <laughs> I'm like, wait, what? Uh, no, it's finished. This, that's, that's not how this works. It's not how any of this works. I'm like having flashes of that Facebook commercial where they're like the book of faces and the grandma's putting the pictures on the wall. That was literally what was going through my mind is that's not how this works. That's not how any of this works. So that table then had to be cut in half and uh, carried up three flights of stairs. Mm. Uh, so... Everything from the original build to a month later when they decided that they loved the Rubio finish that was on it, but they wanted a glossy finish now and wanted me to, to do an epoxy pour on the entire thing after they had had it for a month. So that yeah. added to it. Yeah, that's nice. In a non-controlled environment, in an office building, uh, my first mistake was saying, Sure, I like a challenge. 
So let's see. I do want. Okay, so the the initial build of it was a solid table. So I do yes. have the glue up, and the shaper origin was there to help lay out the design. So this is actually a. What kind of scale would you say this river is? Uh oh gosh. Uh, no, I mean like less than a hundredth. Um, okay. The Cusco, the lower Cuscoquim, with that region is is one of the largest rivers here in Alaska, and. People sometimes when they first see that table, they're like, why is it so weird? Why is it so windy? That table is to such a degree of uh, absolute that the, the people of the Cuscopum actually flew me three hours to that river to stand at that river's bank, collect rocks from it. The people of the region collected the rocks uh, as well as for me to actually lay eyes on the color of the water. So, um, well, most things are, are just a build. This table, the purpose of this table is it sits in that conference room and um, it's kind of hard to see in this picture. I don't think I have them cut out yet, but there's other pictures and you see these circles on the table. Those circles are actually the 12 villages of the lower Cusco. And they're walnut ulus that I use to shape our origin. And an ulu, uh, so yeah, you can see the circles there. An ulu is an Alaska Native uh, cutting device. Those uh, circles are in the exact location of where those villages are along the way. So a big part of my work is telling a story, right? Um, it's is making a connection. So the purpose of this table was so those board members who are sitting there from all across the state are reminded of who they're serving. They're reminded, oh, this people of this village right here are the reason that we're here today. It's a connection to their ancestry. So using the shaper origin was imperative for that project because I couldn't have any delineation from where River Bend was. It had to be where that bend was. Um, and so, of course, um, this was my very first shaper project. I bought the shaper for this reason. I'm like, yeah, sure. <laughs> Let's go. Um, and that didn't work out. It worked out very well in the end, but not at the beginning because it turns out that the shaper at the time could not scan 25 feet and could not handle, uh, the memory that that needed. Mm -hmm. So I reached out to shaper right away. I'm like, uh, hi. So I'm this crazy person up here in Alaska and I have this project and I need your help. So, uh, shaper Sean. And Shaper Sam, actually Sam was integral to that project. He walked me through and they got with the team. And uh, from there, a lot of the changes that you see in the new and the latest update that came out were directly based off those conversations I had with them. Because what we were having a problem with is the winter, the river's so windy. Uh, at the head of the table, it jetties off to what would be your right. But it finishes on your left. And if you've never used the shaper, once you scan your domino tape, then you're, you place your design. Well, it couldn't see the end of the design. It couldn't see, it could see foot one through like foot 10. But no matter how far out I zoomed, it was not able to capture the full 25 feet. So we actually spent, me and the shaper team, we spent probably three days, uh, single degree by degree by degree clocking that table in order to get it on there for me to continue to cut out. Wow. Yeah, there's yeah, a lot of tape. Yeah, there's a lot of tape. Um, because of the span of the table, again, it's starting on the left side and finishing on the right. And you can see in that picture, the bend of the river goes pretty darn near, uh, I think it came within four inches of the edge of the table. So with the swing radius of the river, I needed that much tape in order to scan all of those nuances, but then the machine was getting overloaded. Uh, I am, I am forever grateful for, for Shaper and it's something to be said for their customer, customer support. They had no idea who I was. I had never used a Shaper product before. I, you know, bought it off their website and here I am like, here, uh, help me design this 25 foot table. Please devote your engineers and your brain power to this. And okay, so like with this one here, that's that's what the Shaper Origin looks like. If you're watching this, is it's a handheld CNC machine that actually has like a it's like a video game in a way because you just try to keep the blue 
and it adjusts the the router for you to stay within the lines. So it's really it's pretty easy to use for anyone who's never ha actually held a router. It's actually extremely easy to use. But it the is way the biggest question I get is like I don't understand how it follows the lines, and for me, I didn't understand how it followed the lines either until I got it in my hands. And it's all about that tape for sure. And then, so you had to do two different designs on this. One is being the actual river, yeah. and then you did these inlays of the fish. Yep. Um, so first I did cut out the river and I poured the river. This bench that you're looking at here, the gentleman was retiring. And that is, again, another 100% uh, accurate. That is the Russian river here in Alaska. And where the island is, he wanted to be able to stand there with people who were coming to his home because he's a retired engineer. And he wanted to go, okay, today we're standing right at this bank right here and we're catching rainbow trout. Okay, today we're going to stand here at this bank right here and we're going to catch sockeye salmon. So he wanted uh, a gray salmon or a silver salmon, I'm sorry, a sockeye salmon and a rainbow trout. And uh, he wanted to be exactly accurate with where on the river they would be fishing that day. And that's something that um, traditional CNCs, absolutely, they can do it. But I like the shaper because I feel that I feel that it affords me a little bit more control and a little bit more hands on. Um, uh, I don't know, uh, play versus that I can't get in a CNC. You know, once you send it to the computer, it's, it's going to do exactly what it's supposed to do. It's going to run the program and it's going to cut it. If I'm not liking the way something's looking on, on a piece of wood right at that moment as I'm working with the shaper, I can pull that bit up, dynamically change it, adjust, adjust the tape, adjust the layout, and just get right back to going again. So it's more, uh, maybe it's good for flighty people. That's what I'm trying to say. Yeah, I'm not liking the way this is going. All right, let's fix well, it. Well, it, it's more portable, which is a big advantage in your market because clearly you like to do stuff inside office buildings when the board <laughs> changes things around. So. Yeah, the hand painted fish that you do on that really, so it, we'll get into that too, because that really uh, elevated your art work. It's the best way I know how to put it. Because as we look at, okay. we'll, we'll get into this one here, because this is oh, always gee. my favorite thing. Is, is this a bar top? Oh. Yes. So uh, that is for a place. So that, that piece is aptly named The Weekend at Bernie's. And people are like, oh, from that 80s, rude 80s movie, right? Where like they have the guy and he's the puppet. The place that that stays in is actually called Bernie's Bungalow. And uh, it is a bar in downtown Anchorage. And they approached me and said, hey, we're redoing our sushi bar. And uh, we see that you kind of do epoxy stuff. Uh, have you ever like made an, an ocean on a countertop so i was like well no but again let's <laughs> i like a challenge let's try it, let's yeah. go. so that is actually a 16 foot half moon countertop and then it also has a uh, six foot side wing that is where uh like the till was and some of the condiments etc so yeah that's a bar top and to this day I, she still looks just like that. Well, That's awesome. So would you say that you would be maybe the originator of this type of design? So um, for doing ocean pours, we're going to call those ocean pours. No. Uh, ocean pours have been around on artwork. There's actually a lady out of Hawaii, and her name is Sarah. Uh, I always mess up her last name. It's Caudrel or Caudrel. And I would have to say that she's probably – like the original ocean art person, but she was only doing it uh, on very small canvases. You, you know, these little, they're called um, little pan, wood panels. And not even at the time, she was mostly, mostly doing them on canvases, small necklace projects, etc. Now, having an art background, I'm always fascinated by not just woodworking, but by art. So for me, it was very easy to be like, huh, I wonder if I could take this very tiny, uh, art world project that was 100% unique to very few artists and translate that into my woodworking and make it a, a functional furniture design. So for the process of using epoxy to make oceans, uh, no. Uh, artists have been doing that for 
for probably five or six years, but traditionally painting and then just putting epoxy over their artwork is what they've been doing. Okay. Um, then I started doing, um, figuring out how to incorporate that into woodworking because it's a completely different creature when you're trying to do it with 16 feet. So being the originator of epoxy oceans on woodworking, yes, I think at this point, I am pretty confident in saying I am the originator of that because I remember when that thing debuted, uh, not only did like Insider and Yahoo pick it up, but, you know, it, it was the only one. It also sucks because at the time I was even worse at taking pictures and video than I am now. But you've learned a lot since then. I mean, that was 2019. Yeah. yeah uh, so that piece was actually made in late 2018. Because by February of 2019, when I went to my very first workbench, I was done with it. It had already been, uh, yeah, because people were like, hey, are you the chick making that thing? And I'm like, no, don't talk to me. Uh, there's people here. <laughs> I was terrified. I was like, why are people talking to me? This was such a bad idea. I am such a hermit. I want to go home now. Well, I, I'll tell you, as a finishing person, the first thing I noticed was on the left, well, actually the right side of this photo, you can see the reflection of the light above the table. Uh -huh. And I was highly impressed with the lack of bubbles. Usually whenever you see this, you get a lot of bubbles in it. You know, there's a lot of people that have the bubbles. So I know that you usually show on your Instagram, they have a industrial type heat gun. Is that kind of your secret to being able to get those out of there? Well, I, I think, and, uh, I know this is a big part I teach in my classes. A lot of people get frustrated with epoxy work because we have very, we become very desensitized to these river tables, right? So trademark river table, Jeff owns that. Uh, do you guys know that? That's a trademark word. Yes. Yeah. We, yeah. <laughs> so <laughs> trademark word, the river style tables. There you go. Um, we've, we just think that they're all made out of the same epoxy. And we think, in addition to that, we handle the bubbles the same way. That's not the case. A torch is for popping bubbles. A heat gun is for manipulating epoxy. This is a big thing that I teach in my classes, and this is where people find the most success. So, uh, no, I don't use some big fancy heat gun. Actually, I use a Wagner Furno 300 that you can go buy down at Home Depot. Um, I mean, you could probably buy it at freaking Walmart. It's $24.99. Like twenty four dollars and ninety nine cents, okay, um, and they are the bee's knees. And I have been using those because here in Alaska, it's not. I can't just like go down to the woodworking store and buy fancy stuff. I gotta wait for that stuff to be slow boated up here if the boat even arrives. Yeah. So I didn't have anything fancy. I had a heat gun sitting in my garage. I was like, huh. Yeah, I wonder what this will do. <laughs> Turns out it's it exactly what you need. So, it, and when you started this whole venture doing this type of thing, did you notice that there was a lot of lack as far as supplies? Because I noticed you've done a lot of work with um, Total Boat and even have come out with your own epoxy. Yeah. Um, yes. And it's, not only a lack of supplies here in Alaska, but I, I would have to say as a nation, there's such, you know, epoxy has been around for over a hundred years and we still don't have any sort of collective knowledge of it. There's still so much confusion, right? You have people who love it and hate it. Here in Alaska, it was pretty much an unheard of thing. Um, you know, a few people knew it because of boating and airplane use, but never ever in an artistic or a woodworking manner. And that was also when I got started, uh, right about the time that river style tables were really starting to become either you love them or you absolutely hated them. You know, there's no such thing as a river style woodworking table. It's, you know, a purist. Oh, yeah, that was their worst nightmare. Yeah. So uh, getting supplies here actually forced my hand to become very quick and also very out of the box. Uh, another thing that I have been able to bring to the epoxy and woodworking is the use of, like for instance, HVAC tape. Nobody was doing that before me because trust me, I looked because I was trying to figure out how in the bloody heck 
to keep epoxy in things when I only need, like, I don't, I can't go out and buy some HDPE today. We just don't have that here. No. Um, I mean, we do, but it's also like $64 a square foot because there's only one place in a hundred mile radius that sells it. Whereas you guys can go on Amazon and it's there for you the next day. What I do have is a Home Depot and I would go wander the aisles and be like, huh, will this hold it in? So then as soon as I started finding all of these unique and creative ways to work with epoxy, um, I, I've been open with the things that I'm learning. And now, like, for instance, I was watching a insider YouTube video of people wrapping entire rounds in HVAC tape and holes in their epoxy in. Yeah, I think, uh, was it Black Forest? Uh, they use a ton of that tape whenever they do yeah, theirs. They do. But uh, so speaking of that, uh, copycatting, since uh, when this came out, this there wasn't very much of that out there. Everyone was doing the river tables. Everyone had, you know, their style of it. I mean, every Facebook post, someone was trying to mimic that type of style. And then when this came out, I noticed there was a huge shift away from that. And into these smaller, like um, the the uh, the cutting boards, stuff along those lines. I can't even think of that name. Shakuri. Shakuri boards. Yeah, you go. see, you can see that one better than I can. Shikuri we need to have her on every week because clearly she can say all these names we can't. Yeah. You know what shakuri boards are? Shakuri boards. I actually just posted this meme because it's so true. Shakuri boards are just fancy cutting boards for for an entire generation that grew up on lunch. Oh yeah, that's. I saw that and literally it. snorted. I was going through your stories, not because <laughs> you know so it's true. true. <laughs> it is. So um, yeah, you know, uh, this is where my heart gets torn because turns out I love teaching. Okay, you're talking when I make jokes about workbench about being terrified. I was actually forced to go to workbench, um, and I uh, have very much been a homebody. I, I am very very. Uh, solitary person and that amount of people for me were terrifying and talking to people was terrifying to me like actually having a conversation with people is hard for me uh so as a teacher i always want to see people succeed now which is a weird part of my life i never thought i would be as a creator um i think there's very strongly a difference between copycatting somebody and being inspired by somebody uh it has been difficult because part of me wants to scream from the rooftops like, no, that super cute chicken yoga pants is not the originator of the first um, ocean wave countertop. You know, but then the other part of me is like, hey, you know what? Maybe she needs that, that more than I do, right? Like maybe she okay. needs that uh, sense of self a little bit more than I do. So I always try to find balance in my head. It's hard in this day and age of Instagram and YouTube and TikTok for anybody to be the originator of anything. Uh, it, it, it genuinely is. The only time that I really take beef with it is if you're so inspired by somebody's designs. Uh, you know, like, for instance, when you asked me about the ocean, like, I'm right to Sarah. She was the very first person I saw it. And if you look back through her stuff, you know, she's been an artist for a very, very long time. Uh, and she inspired me to take that and transform it into large scale woodworking projects. If you have a design that's so unique to you, um, and I have a couple of them, not just that one, but like my, my Black Burn set uh, were very unique to me. Uh, and you want to copy that. Yeah, there's the, the Black Burn set. You know, so doing, taking like the Shushugi Bon and then epoxying over that, that was, ooh, that was a, that was a joy. Um, and getting that blue impregnated into that was even, even more tricky. But if you are inspired by somebody so much and you have sway and power and you don't be a kind human by saying, hey, I made this, right? Like, I put the work into it. I made this, but I was inspired by so-and-so. Mm -hmm. I, I kind of I lose a lot of um, good karma feelings towards you. Like, you don't have to tag in every post. You don't have to tag in every video. You don't have to preface everything with saying, 
and yeah, I was inspired by. But that first initial throw out to the world, that first vomit, should be like, oh, by the way, I was choking on somebody else's name was I was making this piece. <laughs> I was, no. <laughs> yeah, I was I was I was scrolling their Instagram when I was following them, but now Yeah, and it just it makes it hard because I, I mean, you guys had uh I said, you know, I'm one of the larger creators that you've had, which is super weird to me, but I'm still such a very small fry. I've only been doing this for 4 years. And I think thank goodness we have Donovan now to help keep me on point and make videos, but I don't um that whole going back to my brain being squirrely, I have all these ideas. And I'm usually a one and done person, right? So I, I do it, I get it out of my system, and I move on to the next thing. But what ends up happening then is that uh, thankfully people get inspired. And then I, I kind of sometimes have these weak moments in my head of like, if I just made ocean pour tables all day, People are selling those for $2,000 all day long. Same thing over and over and over and over again. And here I am like, oh, you know, if but my brain doesn't work that way, right? Like the Blackburn right. set, the YouTube creator who has, that's one of their, their toppest grossing uh, videos. I kick myself because I'm like, oh, they're probably making so much evergreen money off of that darn thing. Um, and my name's nowhere on it. Now that being said, can't have the good without the bad, right? So the right. good is that I've worked with people like John Malecki, Brad Rodriguez. Um, oh my gosh, why am I just forgetting his name? He just, he asked me about his, uh, Johnny Biltz. All of them, they're the first ones to come to me with questions and they are the first ones to mention in their YouTube, hey, we had to ask Jess for help. So I, I, I kind of try to focus on, I know these guys are going to use stuff that they've learned from me, but they're going to give me credit for mm -hmm. it. And, you know, um, they're not, I get frustrated when people are ashamed that they had to ask for help or they were inspired by somebody. That, that bothers me. And it, it does like sting, but I try to push myself to come up with like, well, something better, I guess, for lack of a better word, a new design, a new way to push the limits of woodworking and epoxy and art because to me when people ask me what i am I'm like uh aside from crazy i'm not quite sure uh because i'm not just an artist i'm not just a woodworker i'm not just an epoxy person to me those all three are are just me but we mm -hmm. like to label things you know like so maybe i look at it this way sometimes whenever someone has copied something is in that they had to take that for themselves so they could say that they did something. But the downside is, is that since they were copying and they weren't original, they don't have anything to fall back on after that fade. So everyone who's making these ocean tables for $2,000 a pop, that eventually will fade. It's a trend. And when that trend fades, what are they going to fall back on? When you're someone who can constantly keep coming up with something, and making something new, you don't think about it that way because you're constantly looking for the next challenge and they're looking for what can I copy next? So there's a huge difference between the two. And that's what, that's what saved me mentally as far as social media goes is that there's going to be people that take it. There's going to be people who want to use it for themselves and not give credit. But I know that I'll just make something else up. It's like, okay, that's fine. That's what I had to be. Like I was talking to Chris about this. I had to kind of cancel down on my Instagram so much because people local to us who were into furniture refinishing were taking it, taking our style, taking our designs that my wife and I have come up with for refinishing furniture and then trying to undersell us, basically trying to yeah. cut us. And so it was one of those things where I was like, well, I'll just take a break then. It's not a big deal. Like I'll just sit back and do some other stuff and just not say anything or do anything about it because what will eventually happen is that they'll be like, well, wait, I was following you and I was learning all the things you were doing and copying it and trying to take your business, if you will. Mm -hmm. You just have to be like, that's fine. If that's what you want to do. But then when the source stops, there's no more water coming from the hose. What are they going to do? That's when you bait them <laughs> with, with fake uh, content. This is how I distress yeah. furniture. Yeah, all of a sudden you're like lighting it on fire. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah. No, actually, I had thought about that because uh, what is it? Uh, J uh, J him woodworking Jeff. I don't know if you ever follow him, 
but he does distressing and he 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 does it properly but at the same time he makes a joke out of it like he'll take a thing of chains and he'll take a thing of nails and he'll just throw it at the table like yep i'm distressing today and it's like yeah i should probably just do a joke post one time but that's kind of how you do it so at the same time i can't do that but it, it uh, sucks it, it does suck i mean for instance and that's where like i said i'm torn right because turns out I'm a teacher at heart. Like I have found my most happiness, honestly, uh, in, in teaching classes and teaching people how to do stuff. But like today, for instance, I, I took a hit to the heart when I saw uh, another, another location. Um, one of their students took my class and is now not only teaching classes, but teaching them for less, way less. Like I'm not even sure how they're actually covering material costs, which is not good business, but um, it's it's always that that balance, that very precarious balance of mm -hmm. what do you give to the universe, right? And what do you give to people who are trying to be better at themselves and balance it with the people who are not going to give you credit. Um, all of a sudden, the latest thing, by the way, I'm going to put this out here. I started making stained glass with epoxy. And I, I started teaching that my first time I taught it. The debut of that was at Laguna uh, in California, Laguna Beach, when Laguna brought me down there a couple months ago. And already now my Facebook is starting to fill up with people who are making stained glass epoxy. And I'm like, I'm looking at it right here and it made me think of it. The first, very first prototype of stained glass epoxy is sitting right here. And uh, all of a sudden now it's, it's, uh, it's the new thing, lasers and uh, stained glass epoxy. Well, being a trendsetter has got its downsides. It does. it does. Well, you know, you know, Mike and I are very right, right. familiar with this concept. When you're when you teach someone from your knowledge and from your heart, and someone else yeah. ends up teaching that same information, they're just relaying the information the knowledge and the experience and the wisdom that you've earned and, and gleaned from, from doing those things and, and working through all those problems, they're going to have to experience some of those and they won't know how to fix it yeah. like, and, like you do. And so, so you, you, your, your side is we, Mike and I, we just stand back and go like, you know what? You keep regurgitating information when you want the real answer, come talk to us and we'll give you the right answer. So it you, is, you in this case are the right answer. Yeah. It's, uh, it's so, I found out somebody was taking my class slides and removing my name and teaching my class. Oh, and then, gracious. And, and somebody called me. They were so excited. They're like, Jess, we're going to take a class from you. I'm like, oh, cool. And I thought they were going to be in like Idaho or something. And they were like, oh, no. And I think uh, Minnesota or Minneapolis or something. I'm like, uh, I'm I'm not coming there that I'm aware of. Am I coming there? And I'm, I'm like mentally taxing my brain, concerned that I forgot a date. And they actually came back to me and they're like, oh, it turns out you're actually not teaching it. It was somebody who was saying, take a Jess Crow-like class. I'm like, wait a oh, minute. that's wrong. Like, you can't use my name to sell your classes. And that's but, not how, again, this is not how any of this works. Right. Yeah. And so I feel like along this journey of learning epoxy and woodworking, I'm also learning how to social media. And it turns out that that's probably a lot harder than uh, uh, the woodworking I anticipated. Part. Yeah. yeah. I'd, uh, sometimes I feel like we need a soft stop version of social media, like where you can stop from chopping off your fingers and your arm before you get too far. Or just know how much of your post to post. That's That was my issue is know when to just show enough to give them the idea, but not give away the secrets. And in, in the case of the slides, though, good yeah. gracious. Yeah, I, it's been hard. There's one table, though, you'll never get out of me. If you've been on my social and if you've been following for a while, you'll see them at the beginning of my social media journey. But you haven't seen one in a very, very long time. And it's my version of a Blue River style table. Uh, if you go way back on my feed, you'll see them every once in a while. But I stopped posting those because those are 100%. Even in both the art, there's, there's, this is literally the only thing I can say. In both the art world, the woodworking, and the epoxy world, I am the only one. And I stopped posting pictures of it because it was a lit middle of the night, can't sleep uh, epiphany for mm -hmm. me. 
troubleshooting problem I had been working on for a very, very long time. And, uh, yeah, I stopped posting them because I... You want to keep that one for yourself. It is, it even more so than the fish, that is my signature style. That bright blue splash going diagonally down those. And I show it in class. Uh, those, that is a very, very peculiar technique. And uh, one that you would, yeah, you have to have a warp brain to figure that one out. I'll show you the end result, but you're not going to see the process. That's right. Yeah, I even stopped showing the end result because, you know, I'm, I'm smart enough to know that if I'm smart enough to figure it out, somebody just needs a little bit of time staring at it. And they're going to at least start making progress. So for right now, after four years, that is still the only thing that I am the only person doing. So we'll see. <laughs> maybe, maybe have yourself a nice big class of some sort, you know. I don't know how you would be able to do that if you wanted to show the world how that's done later, but that's, that's a tough one because you got to keep it, it for yourself. It is because it's a very, very challenging technique. It's, it's very challenging. It's doable. Uh, the best example of it, actually, is the salmon headboard. If you guys are familiar with that one, mm -hmm. uh, I have the nine foot live, the nine foot tall live edge and the salmon are running up it. And I actually have pictures of the edge of that table. And people are always like, wait a minute, how did you do that? That is a very good example of that technique. I remember. Okay. I do remember that one. I didn't get pictures of that one. I was the, the next thing I was going to show was the river run series that you're doing. Yeah. And I, th I like how you incorporate the actual natural materials into it to make it more three-dimensional, more lifelike, and at the same time, you can hang it on the wall. Yeah. Well, I mean, not everybody can afford, right, uh, large tables. And I think as woodworkers, uh, that's where artists have an advantage over you. Woodworkers have a tendency to feel like, well, if I'm not selling a dresser or a table or a chair, that my work isn't being honored or isn't something that people are going to want. But if you think about it, uh, you know, bowl turners, they understand the value of a very small piece. I wanted to be able to take uh, river style art tables, epoxy, and frankly, make it more affordable, make it so people maybe who don't have a space to put a table in uh, or the funds to buy their mom a uh, river style table could own a piece of river art in their place and space. So why not take that, build a frame, use some of the scrap woods, and, you know, put it on the wall. Now, is this so, something that's a run as far as you're doing so many? Because you have sizes 12 by 12 all the way to 36 mm -hmm. by 36? Yep. Uh, okay. So I only did those for a limited time. I haven't actually made one of those in over a year. Uh, I've got some sitting actually right there because I just kind of stopped making them. Uh, that was another interesting thing. So I developed a technique of making the water look 3D. And then all of a sudden, everybody wanted to know how to make the water tactile. Right? So look, if you look at the epoxy on that, the water is, is actually yeah. tactile. Uh, you know, those, uh, I'll tell you right now, those salmon, those are only painted in one layer, but they look like they are painted in, you know. They look like they're coming out of it. Yeah. Uh, I kind of stopped doing them because uh, I started getting a lot of frankly nasty messages that really killed my vibe of people asking, like, how do you do this? And being like, well, here's the overview, right? Here's, here's, the, here's the thought that I had that helped me develop that style. And then I was getting messages of like, well, you don't want to see us. You don't want to see other creators succeed. And um, I know I shouldn't take that stuff to heart, but I'm going to tell you right now. For as tough a chick I am, late at night, that stuff still stings, right? Like, mm -hmm. it still hurts. And so it was just easier for me to be like, all right, I'm just going to take a break. Uh, you know, and it's been kind of cool seeing different techniques, the people's ways that they, they've they now made that technique a little bit different. Um, you know, some people use saran wrap. I don't know if you've seen that, but they wait till the epoxy is mm -hmm. kind of almost cured, and then you can put saran wrap on it. And push it down and then you know like the saran wrap leaves an impression okay That's one way to do it other people have developed that technique in the answer to me not being forthcoming with that 
Which is like, I don't know. I kind of feel like a jerk saying that out loud, like not being forthcoming with something. But at the same time, you almost had that tough love approach where you made them figure it out. They liked the look. You didn't give them the exact formula for it. So they had to figure it out. And that's kind of the idea behind a lot of this. I mean, that's how woodworkers did it for centuries was that, you know, they would see something and be like, I really like how they did that or built that, but they're dead now and I can't ask them how it works. So how do I do it? They just try to do it their way. And good teachers never give all the answers anyway. Never. They always give just enough information to let you go try that and figure, let you get creative with your methods. So I, I, I give you kudos on that. Yeah. Don't feel like a jerk. I don't think that's fair for you mentally, as far as just, you didn't tell them exactly how it was going to go. They're being selfish. So. Yeah. But those are fun pieces. So yeah, using natural elements, I think is important. I think it's an underutilized thing in almost every art woodworking. Like we use wood, right? Mm -hmm. It comes from trees. Uh, if you were to make just even, let's say you don't use epoxy, uh, you take grandma's favorite stone and let's say grandpa's passed away and they used to sit at their rock garden. Why, why are we not incorporating grandpa's rocks that him and grandma used to put into the furniture, right? Like, mm -hmm. people buy stories. Yeah. You know, so I, I, I'm, I've been fascinated by the woodworking's uh, community's lack of incorporating actually more than wood. <laughs> you know? Yeah. Uh, okay, I can, I can see that. Does that make sense? Yeah. Well, does. see, the, a lot of the woodworkers, especially the more traditionalist woodworkers, they they get stuck on styles, you know, craftsmen or, or whatever, whatever their style is. And those styles typically didn't involve being creative and artistic with wood. And I get that a lot with people asking me, well, give me the dimensions or the plans on what you did. I, I literally scratched it on a napkin and made it exactly what I wanted for my shop to fit my needs. Mm -hmm. So if you want dimensions, I mean, watch the video. They're there. Make it to fit you. That's the whole idea about being a woodworker is like you said, conforming your tools to you mm -hmm. is, is make your jigs and your fixtures and the things you make to make your life easier in your shop, make them the way you want them. Not the way, the number one video on YouTube makes them make them to suit your needs. And that's, you know, you're, you're clearly doing that. You're saying, well, okay, I did this. I'm done with this. Now let's move on. Let's, let's do something bigger and better. So, you know, great appreciation for how you're handling yourself and, and the work you're doing. Cause I don't have the artistic ability to include stuff and do things like you do. I can't. Oh, yes. But see, that's the thing. Like I don't get that with woodworkers. I'm going to pick on you for a second here, my friend. There's nothing about woodworking that is not artistry. Mm -hmm. Give me one. I, I mean, I, I can walk you through the list. Everything from picking that species of wood to designing that angle to the care that you take when you're cutting that miter to the dovetails to the screw selection. What part of that does not include an eye for art? And every bit of that I'm 100% on. I've, I've tried my hand artist. at carving my brain and my hands do not cooperate when it comes to having this vision and being able to draw it or to carve it out. Now I can what learn. What makes you an artist? Build. Is it because you can use a pen? No, clearly not. <laughs> so I mean, so that's what I'm saying, right? So as we put people in these boxes, we make them feel less than. You are an artist. If you do anything, if you create Cheerio shapes on your kid's tray, you are an artist and woodworkers i have discovered they hold themselves back so much by feeling like yeah i'm not an artist i can't do that but come and hang out with me in a class and you will leave there and you're like dude i'm freaking bob ross uh, okay i'll i'll defend this one for chris and help you out on this just because he is he just doesn't give himself credit he, oh, he made dude. this Okay, he did a lot of CNC liar, liar, work, a lot of, fire. yeah, he had a lot of finishing techniques he tried out. Like, there was a lot that he did in this whole project, and he's just like, yeah, I'm not an artist. I have never met a single woodworker who is not an artist. Because then you talk to them, you ask them a question, and they're like, yeah, I picked this, this black screw because it, it highlighted this walnut wood, or I went with this ebony because it looked fantastic with this marble 
And if you get them talking, all of a sudden you realize that our definition of artist is not what, it's not holding paper to pen. It's not holding paintbrush to pen. As soon as we start calling ourselves what we are, artists and learners and woodworkers, instead of I'm just a crafter, you know, uh, all of a sudden your world feels bigger. You're like, dude, I'm an artist. Like, oh, I made that. It, it just, it makes you feel so much better in your heart being able to not put yourself into, ah, I just make furniture. Eh, that takes no skill. Have you seen my pallet furniture lately? Yeah, I made a pallet the other day. I use quality <laughs> nails. No, I think, I think we're traditional woodworkers in all of the literature that they're given, the issue they come down in is that they see it as a detail. Like a carving on a piece of furniture is a detail that they added or the molding that they put on there. They don't, they're not thinking of it as an artistic standpoint. They're thinking of it as a detail to enhance it. And I think that's where the, the line is broken for a traditional woodworker versus someone who they really are an artist because they thought of that detail, but they just don't look at it that way. So like in Chris's point, he doesn't look at it that way. He's just like, yeah, no, I just burnt the edge of it and I thought it was cool. Yeah, there's a reason why it's cool. Like that's different. Chris is getting a shirt that says I am an artist. Yeah, there you go. And then it has and then it's a silver sharpie Jess Crow on the side. It's one of one of a kind. <laughs> one of a kind. Oh man. Well, one of the reasons we obviously wanted to also have you on is being a female in a mainly men populated world. You've risen to the top in your craft clearly because you you've got skills so uh, uh, talk to some of the and maybe there'll be some females listening down the line some of the things you had to work through to get men to pay attention to your skill not your attire mm -hmm. because that was one of the one of the reasons why we i really liked what you do on your channel mm -hmm. is if i see the thirst trap I continue to swipe. I don't even bother to stay there because if, if you're going to talk woodworking, I want to know that I can trust you talking woodworking is you doing the woodworking, not you being the face of the woodworking channel or the yoga and, pants. Right. Clearly you see, I've tried the yoga pants. It, it doesn't work. You oh know I mean? Gosh, I got horrible. Yeah. I mean, there was, there was like, matter of fact, I, I lost subscribers and followers. Um, but no, maybe right explain here. a little bit about that and 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 share because there's going to be a lot of females that will maybe learn from what you have to say about that. What you've had to endure, because and it is it's uh, uh I'm not gonna lie. Okay, so this is an interesting subject in, in a lot of ways. One of my very first uh, encounters of like dude, are you talking to me? Was, uh, I was actually here at a local specialty store and I was picking up something for, uh, I think I was picking up like a, a new part of my, my festival and I'm standing at the counter and I'm checking out and this very kindly older gentleman, he shuffles up to the counter and he was getting ready to check out and he looks over at me and he goes, Ooh, they sure make delivery girls cute nowadays. And I'm like, uh, you know, and I'm having that moment in my head because for him, that was not a disrespectful thing to say. He genuinely was trying to pay a compliment to me. And I was able to use that as a, as a teaching opportunity, not only for him, but because my, my youngest daughter was with me. Um, and, I, and I just kindly turned to them. And you, you always have two options, right? Uh, in any situation, you have two options, fight or flight. Uh, I decided to look at him and say, uh, I'm sure they do, sir, but I'm I'm here picking up. And I just went into this big spiel about this stuff that I was getting. And he was like, oh, oh, you you do woodworking? Um, and I was like, yeah. And I'm showing my kid how to do it. And I got my little girl with me. And uh, he's like, that's that's wonderful. You know, I, I didn't, you know, when, when I was doing woodworking, women didn't do that stuff. So you've got a twofold thing. You, you do. I hate to be generational. You have an entire generation that is not familiar with women being in the trades, period. Yeah. It doesn't matter if it's woodworking, it doesn't matter if it's plumbing, it doesn't matter if it's an electrical, it doesn't matter if you're a lineman. Women traditionally have always been in the background of the trades. There's always been women in the trades. 
Mm -hmm. Traditionally, they were not very highlighted and or they were uh, made to take the stance of, frankly, being uh, accustomed to uh, vulgarness or, um, you know, being sexualized because they were a woman in the trades. So now on social media, right, it's really hard to compete with yoga pants. Being a woman, I also have an infinite respect for other women who take care of their uh, selves and have, uh, and, and I'm by me, I mean take care of themselves in the sense of their mental health. I don't care if you are um, a, uh, what we refer to in my house as a thick girl, um, and you can rock those yoga pants, or if you are a hard body girl and you're rocking those yoga pants, if your customer base is there for that, then I say all power to you, right? Like if that's what your customer base is demanding and that is where you're finding um, happiness from, then that I'm, I'm totally behind that because it doesn't matter if she's walking around naked, if she's got skills, then uh, she has my, my hats off to her. Now that being said, when I first started this journey, uh, some people as I was seeking advice, said, you need to show more cleavage. These were men in the industry here on social media, as well as companies. Uh, uh, companies, their sales team would also be like, we're looking for more. We've, we've, got, we've got a woman on our social media team. Um, so if you're going to be on there, we need you to show a little bit more skin. Like they needed the token chick, okay? They mm -hmm. needed that thirst trap, right? Um, so for a while there, I actually did kind of try that approach of like more posed photos, you know, a little bit more cleavage hanging out, um, you know, trying to accent my body more than my work because that was what it seemed to be, right? That was what people seemed to want. But for me, I didn't find comfort in that. That was not something that I was comfortable doing. But then I'm also not going to hide from the fact that I am a woman, and I have honestly worked so hard in my life to go from 300 pounds down to the weight that I am right now to feel ashamed for my body that if I happen to be in a tank top or if I happen to be in yoga pants and that is the day that I do filming, I shouldn't be made to feel like I know less than because I look good, which I don't. Trust me. There's a reason that I'm not filming in yoga pants, okay? Um I have yet to meet a woman who would say, would not say that. They, every woman I've met, oh, no, I don't look good. I'm ugly. But all women say that. Well, I, and I don't, it's, it's hard. So I guess that's what my final, my, my kind of answer is on that, is that I know a ton of women who actually look phenomenal in freaking yoga pants and also have the brains to back that up. What drives those accounts is the fact that we monetize sexuality, which there's nothing wrong with sexuality. So I need to be very clear with that. Um, but we monetize it to such a degree that those thirst traps pay more than what I can make simply showing you guys how to do stuff. Mm -hmm. um, so that makes it unbalanced, right? And it makes us, it makes us as women have to choose. Do I want to work 10 times harder and keep my clothes on? Or do I want to be able to go on vacation with my partner by keeping my clothes off and having to work 10 times less? So that, that's where it makes it really, really hard because all those chicks that are just killing it in those thirst traps are getting three times more payment for their uh, YouTube, uh, blowing up for... Uh, their Instagram blowing up, they're getting more monetization and they're able to spend more time with their partners. So it, it's, it's very, very hard because even if they have the skills, they're overlooked simply because they're monetizing the thirst trap situation. You know, so for me, that's not an area I'm comfortable in. I'm not comfortable right. that being my main source. My main source is my mind. But that's, an, that's a choice that I make. Uh, people joke with me all the time, dude, Jess, you should make like an epoxy calendar, right? Like you should just 
uh, all the time. Like you're laughing now. I'm laughing because that doesn't even make sense. But... Right? They're just like, if you just stood there like in your swimsuit, like in a bikini and pretend you're reporting epoxy, you could live off the royalties of that and you wouldn't have to do any work. And you know, even though you guys are giggling, that that is probably an accurate statement. Wow. Um, you know, See, so the, as, as a dad of three daughters, nothing I've learned more in raising those three girls is, yes, if you're beautiful, accept it. But that doesn't mean you have to flaunt it. No, and you have to make that moral choice. If, if, you're, if you choose to go down that road, that's a choice you're willing to sacrifice your mind to show off your body. Instead, hide your body and show off your mind. So that's just a, a dad of three girls perspective on the whole philosophy. And I think women in woodworking is amazing. I think it's long overdue because women overdue. are so, so talented. They're so much more detail oriented. And because you guys can have like a, a thousand thoughts at one time, whereas <laughs> men can only have one, you guys can do so much better than we can in, in general terms. And, well, and it is, it's, it's a very, very hard place and space to be because there wouldn't be thirst traps if there wasn't monetization of them. Yeah. You, you know, and um, that's, that's a straight up fact in any sort of trade and any sort of skill set. Uh, you know, a, a sexy CEO of a company is going to get more uh, airtime than a frumpy CEO of a company. So it's it's a very interesting place and space that we're in right now. Like I'm talking, you know, with the growth of Instagram and TikTok and the growth of women in the trades in general with what's expected of us versus where we want to be versus uh, where we're going. Because I can honestly tell you that I've had tool companies, their marketing people approach me and be like, yeah, uh, you know, we've got 50 dudes on the, on the payroll. We've already got one woman, that's all we need. But if you can be a little more sexier, we could talk. Mm -hmm. So it's- That blows it's, my mind. It's, uh, really it's it. hard because then what's your choices, right? Yeah. Uh, yeah. If I be a little sexier, and I can be getting 2K a month for just being me uh, versus I got to work for 20 hours to get that 2K. How that message that we're sending to these young female entrepreneurs and Instagram and TikTok and woodworkers is it actually doesn't matter how good you are at any of your trade. It just matters what you look like. So there's, I would love to just throw shade and say like all the chicks who are just, prancing around in bikinis and being unsafe. Um, like, yeah, I totally hate them, but I have a level of respect that they've been able to monetize maybe a lack of, uh, whether that be skills or whether that be a CEO of a company approached him and was like, here, show your bot and we'll pay you $10,000 a month to stand here by this log machine doing absolutely nothing. Um, yeah. You know, who's dumber, them for taking the money or the people who knew that that would rank in 50 million views in a weekend. Yeah. And that, and that's, that's the tough game to play. Cause if, if we were to look back at something like tool time, you know, home improvement, the only women that were really on the show, as far as the tool time part just came out to bring out the tools. And Pamela that's Anderson, right? Pamela Anderson and, and Debbie Dunning were the two ladies on the show that that's all their job was for that tool time particular segment. And to look at it somewhat to say, okay, that's where a lot of mentality still goes today kind of drives me nuts as, as a marketing person because I don't look at it that way. I look at it completely different. It's the skill set. What can you bring to the table to help people learn and move forward? There's one YouTube channel I used to watch a lot of. They did a lot of slabs. It was the husband. It was a husband and wife team, and she would be in the background every once in a while. And then one day I noticed there was a huge shift at 300,000 views where she was wearing those TikTok yoga pants. And I'm like, wait, what's changed? And now he's nowhere to be found. He's gone. And she's the only one in there. And it's like, it, I'm gone from the channel. Like, I don't watch it anymore. But it was really interesting because they had huge logs that they were cutting up and then the things they did with it. So it was cool to watch. 
Uh, but then when it changed over to that, I'm like, okay, I can see what they found worked for them. And it's no longer about woodworking at this point. Yeah. And, and it's not. So I think universally, uh, what I would encourage, particularly your male audience is, uh, so this is a twofold for the male audience out there and for the male woodworkers. Uh, one, if it doesn't matter at all what a woman looks like, uh, period, whether what she looks like, or I mean, literally, actually, if she's choosing to not wear any clothes, because uh, as you mentioned, uh, you know, you're the father of three young daughters, and I am the mother of three daughters, and I'm learning a lot, even to this day. My youngest is 18, 20, and my middle daughter is 21, and my oldest daughter is 26. And I, myself, come from a generation of, um, uh, you know, if, if you show too much skin and you draw attention to you, that was uh, you. Whereas I'm learning from my girls uh, very much so. And that, you know, uh, if, if their neckline is showing, that's not an invitation for anything. Um, right. So... It, I think we as creators, as influencers, as marketers, need to hold on to that standard that uh, particularly a woman, it doesn't matter what she looks like. If she has the skills to perform something and she's performing it her way, then she is a, she's a valid, fierce fighter in this arena. Yeah. Um, and if she has found a way to, uh, frankly, capitalize on that thirst trap because uh, there is a large company. I'm sorry to say, but that that uh, com the YouTubers that you were talking about, they're they're uh, breaking in uh, more money than I'll see in a year in one video due to their monetization. Um, and she's going on vacations with her husband now all the time because they're posting a lot of pictures of beautiful <laughs> tropical locations. Uh, if we don't like that, we need to evaluate the way that we're marketing and what we're looking. Because here we are talking about them, right? So anybody who didn't know about them, they know about them now. Yeah. yeah. And they're going to look. So I just have a hard time throwing shade any direction when I know that, like, if I'm faced with, you know, somebody walks up to me and uh, I'm a struggling mom, right? Like, I'm not in that situation. But if I were in that situation of, gosh, I'm trying to make this whole YouTube thing work. Uh, I got to feed my kids. If I got to don some freaking yoga pants to put food on the table and I'm going to get paid 10 times more than working 60 hours a week and I can take that 60 hours and afford my kids' education and afford their meds and their food, I am going to be honest and tell you that I would have a hard time. And I think I know a lot of single dads that would be like, dude, if I get to don yoga pants and get paid, I would do it too doesn't work the same way, but yeah. It, the idea That's it. I'm starting, an only, I'm starting an OnlyFans. That's all I can tell you after this. We're gonna, would, the what not OnlyFans page or something. I don't oh, know. my gosh. No, 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 no. We'll have somebody would pay now. for it. I have learned that somebody will always pay for it. There ain't nobody paying for this. Trust me. <laughs> <laughs> so that was Although, a long-winded <laughs> version of it, right? Like it is. It's hard being a chick in this field, right? You're pulled in multiple, multiple directions. It, it is hard. It's it, and and. I just have to say that I would, I found that for me, that was not a comfortable arena. So I doubled down on what was comfortable for me. Uh, for a young female entering this field, um, I would say don't listen to anybody who tells you anything that you have to do. Like if they're telling you you have to be in a turtleneck with bunny boots on and a hat to hide that you're a female in order to have your brain be heard, don't. Don't pay any heed to that. You find what you are comfortable in yeah. and you rock it. If you are a female and you're unsure of your skill set and you need to walk around in a bikini, uh, then you know what? There's an audience for it. And if it pays your bills, you do you, girlfriend, right? Uh, there is no body shaming that should be allowed in any way, shape, or form. And any men or woman that throw shade on that doesn't have your best interest. Chris, well, what I'm, I found I'm is sorry the, now for all the short jokes. Yeah, <laughs> is that <laughs> body shaming too? <laughs> no, that's a little gray area. We can do that. Okay. Yeah. Well, I mean, and what I found is is in the industry, if people start trying to change who you are, that's that's the wrong wrong approach. 
Yeah. You know, if, if you've got these mad skills and, and like you said, it doesn't matter what you look like. It doesn't matter how you dress. If they start trying to dictate and drive you in a way that changes who you are as an, as an artist, <clears throat> then, then that's yeah. wrong. Yeah. Why did you have to put it in quotes? <laughs> because she said, <laughs> I was I listening at home. It. Well, no. So she would know that I heard what she said. I no. listened and I absorbed what she said as an artist you know, d- don't let them change who you are as an artist or as a person. And and that's what I see a lot of these companies trying to do. And you hit on that a little bit. And it's okay to kind of lean that way. But like you learned, when you get into outside of your comfort zone, just pull yourself back in and go back to being you. And if it means sacrificing and struggling a little bit, it's worth it because you're still you. You're not being driven by some man who says you need to look a- away or do a certain thing or act a certain way or whatever that's just my my opinion so and and one more thing of what chris is not an artist he did not spray this texture on those drawers or make (sighs) those knobs so chris is not an artist by any means he's like the worst stick figure drawer i've ever seen in my life yeah he is totally even my stick figures look ugly (laughs) (laughs) says the guy rocking yoga pants yeah okay so i had an idea So Donovan made a good point here is that uh, he doesn't know how flattering yoga pants would be on him. What happens if we made a calendar for the epoxy thing, but you had an offset of you doing whatever you wanted to do in it, but then having a guy in yoga pants on the other side, like having both. I think that is a phenomenal idea. I think I need to have like the men of Instagram and what it needs to be is every month I've got a different woodwork. Yeah, and I'm yeah. like in full protective PPE. Like I'm in total PPE. You're total in the proper like- gear for doing <laughs> epoxy and they're just in yoga pants turning around like, yeah, I'm doing it. I yes. Oh my gosh. I think that is going to be the best selling calendar idea ever. There is actually a calendar here in Alaska. It's called the Men of Alaska. And it's all these fishermen, oil rig workers, roughnecks. And they are in the most, uh, for instance, uh, I don't know if you guys are old enough to remember Burt Reynolds on the fur rug. Oh, yeah. Okay. So picture that, but they've got like a salmon. They're naked and they've got like a salmon. Oh, that's awesome. Right. And they're on a fishing boat and they've got like, you know, so, uh, oh, yeah, I, I think this is going down. This is going to be the official What Not podcast uh, calendar of uh, 2022. <laughs> <laughs> the yoga pants, the guys in yoga pants. We're gonna have to get Gary in yoga pants. Well, no, actually, I want okay. him in ski pants. I want Izzy in yoga pants. I've seen that. I don't know. Well, it's not so bad. It's I'm not just so kidding. bad. It's not so bad, though. No. But that would be <laughs> great to have everybody uh, just do the yoga pants thing because there's a lot of male content creators that know this is a field they cannot compete in. There's just there's just not that that amount of monetization on their yoga pants. But I mean, if you think about it, uh, probably 90% of the audience that they're not competing with is their, their friends and their buddies and their partners, yeah. right? Yeah. And it's, it is a, it's a fascinating hole that like we would need to devote an entire podcast to of this weird dark side of social media. Um, anything from the amount of sugar daddies I get on every given week to, uh, you know, why are those channels monetized and talked about more? And, uh, you know, and then, and then the, the, the flip side to that of why women feel body shame that like, I'm uncomfortable being in a tank top in my own shop and posting a picture of it because of, of the commentary that I get from that. The backlash. Um, which it, sh- it shouldn't be a deal, yeah, right? Like no. if it's 90 degrees in my freaking shop, I should feel comfortable posting a picture of me in a tank top. And that's, that's something with me, right? Like that's a a thing inside my own head. But the fact that that exists out there and all of these women who have the bravery and strength to just be like, screw you, it's 80 degrees. It's 110 degrees. I'm going to wear a freaking bikini if I want to. Mm -hmm. They are the unicorns of this situation right now. Um, You know, so again, that that would be a whole nother uh, so are our, you coming back on for a part two? Is that what I'm hearing? We'll just go uh, down the dark road of uh, social media. Yeah, we can do the dark the road. There's, we could call it what, what not after what dark. dark. What not after dark. And it would yeah, be yeah. because there's some stuff that I would not be able to necessarily be like super uh, whew, mellow about, I think is a word I'm going to use. Uh, you know, uh, I'm uh, 
something. Here it is. My daughter, she gave me the best compliment of my life. It almost makes me like tear up just thinking about it, right? She, so she was describing me to somebody and she said that uh, my mom has uh, the, the mind of a scholar, the heart of a saint, and the mouth of a sailor. So uh, when I'm talking to people, particularly in any sort of event that's going to be recorded and I'm not sure of the audience, I'm always like, oh, don't swear. Don't say a bad word. Uh, don't use that very uh, unflattering parallel. Of like like I said, like the artist and the woodworker vomiting type thing. Mm -hmm. I have to remind myself. So it would have to be an after dark where it just wouldn't have to be wouldn't have concerned. To the only thing we ever ask is that there's no cussing. Other than that, I mean, if you want to say that artistry and woodworking is like vomiting, I heard I heard <laughs> earlier, and I was like, in a way, that really makes sense. So I'm, it doesn't matter. It is. It is. You always have. Uh, I think one of the greatest marriages ever, and uh, somebody is capitalizing on this. Is I was talking to a group of artists, and I told them, they were like, "I'm not comfortable using a router. I'm not comfortable using a table saw." Um, is every artist? strictly artists should find themselves a woodworker and every woodworker should find themselves an artist. I have seen one of those marriages happen from that conversation and they are killing the uh, uh, ocean style uh, tables. Uh, she does all the pours. He does all of the woodworking. That is entirely what their Etsy is and that is 100% what they do. And uh, that has provided a sustainable income for both of them. And he doesn't have to worry about being a quote artist. She doesn't have to worry about being a woodworker. And it works out really well as far as the teamwork goes. Yep. They don't even live in the same state, I believe. That's even better. Yeah, right? Like the best long distance relationship ever. Nice. <laughs> well, Jess, if you have the time, we would enjoy to have you back on and talk about the several things that we said we were going to talk about and we didn't. Cause we had a whole list of things and that one was one of them. Um, we'll give so your viewers a preview of what we're going to talk about next time. I need there to. you go. That works for me. So there's been a lot of comments. Um, I think there's definitely going to be a lot of conversation after the fact on this one, as far as just the, I don't know what you call it. Cause there's so many like key trigger words nowadays, but just the male toxicity in trying to break through for the ladies out there who have these talents in woodworking, who aren't mm -hmm. just there to just show off, if you will, to get the views. They're there to show what they've learned, their journey, their experience, the whole nine yards. Yeah. And our goal and here is to, to, to just share woodworking and people who are, are sort of masters in their, of, of their own craft. We like to have the, the, diversity and we like to have the different skill sets and the different projects that are done. And if you go back and look at some of our old stuff, I mean, you can see, please we, don't. Yeah. Well, once we started having guests on anyway, we, we tried to bring that mix to the table because our whole goal is we want people to learn woodworking or, or, yeah, I think or we were a form of that. Boxy. And yeah, well, we so talked that about that's, a, little. That's, a little, that's, that's all tied into it. So, you know, you know, we'd love to have you back sometime. And, and if you know of any, uh, any other females who are trying to get into welding or, you know, any kind of other oh, art form, you know, and, and, you know, just let them come on and share their, uh, share their talents and share their experience with others. And next time you come on, we'll actually talk about beginners of epoxy and how to get started and all that and how to choose the right epoxy. You know, those are all things that we really wanted to talk about tonight, but Hey, the conversation never goes the way we want it to. It always yeah. leaves where it needs to. It, it really is always that whatnot when people say they're bringing up something. Yeah, we'll go ahead and talk about epoxy and woodworking and whatnot. It always turns into the whatnot and we don't try mm -hmm. to make it. But I will say that I was really happy that you went into your struggles as far as what you've had to learn to be in the public eye. Because yeah, I, I mean, think and, people need to know that. And, and again, like we talked about, we didn't even, we, first of all, totally down for coming back. Okay. Awesome. 100% down you. for coming back. We can absolutely do this again. Um, and, and, you know, I, I think it would also behoove us to do it sooner rather than later. Uh, that being said, you know, epoxy and woodworking and any sort of skill set is a very dynamic and fluid and ever-changing thing. I mean, if you look at where woodworking was 10 years ago and CNC's, like you say that word, and it was you were like, ah, spit on, right? 
uh, to the fundamentalness of now having a CNC in your shop. Unfortunately, I hate to akin this to it, but uh, epoxy and women in this skill set are kind of, you know, where strangely, this is a, another way that just connects the dots in our brains, where CNCs and stuff were uh, 10 years ago, that an anomaly uh, mm -hmm. versus an everyday, like everybody's got a bloody CNC in their shop nowadays of some shape or form. Um, so I would love to get a chance to, to talk about that and how that has actually shaped my ability to learn by myself. You know, in the prior to coming on here, we were talking about the whole mansplaining thing and um, whatnot. So I think that a lot of guys shy away from teaching women woodworking because they don't want to feel like they're having to mansplain something, right? Like they're actually being cognizant of that desire to not do that. But there's a way that men can approach that situation that could help a lot of women. Uh, and I, I really feel that men who have been doing woodworking for a long time have an invaluable skill set, that there are so many young women out there that could benefit from it. We just need to make sure that we're communicating uh, instead of being like, damn, they make delivery girls cute. Yeah. You know, <laughs> you could be like, hi, miss, you know, like what you got there? And then open that door to that conversation. Actually, I think that would be its, in itself its own podcast because that would mm -hmm. be, there's so many, there's such a big generation gap within three to four generations right now and all the different mindsets that go with it. And the one thing that's connecting them all is woodworking, that it would be really helpful for them to be able to understand how to approach it and how to open up the conversation and how to tell someone how to do something without because Chris had to teach me this I was I'm absolutely horrible at it to kindergarten it down is the best way he knew how to say it start at the bottom with everybody figure out what they know what their skill set is and then start to build on that conversation with trying to teach them something I would go into like stupid detail about something and you could tell there was deer in the headlights they were like <laughs> uh what are you talking about no matter who it was and that was always that face-to-face -face conversation so even I could definitely learn something from that because there's a hundred times where my wife will ask me something and I don't realize I'm doing it. I really don't. And I'm trying to learn every day whenever she'll, she'll give me that look where it's like, really, you're going to start that right now. And I was like, Oh, I'm so sorry. I did that. So that for myself, I would benefit from that hundred percent. And I would love to have that conversation. I am, I am down for that. I've had the benefit of teaching hundreds and hundreds of women and, um, in addition to that, working with other foundations that particularly bring women and young women, uh, as well as young teens into the tools and into the, excuse me, into the trades. And that is an opportunity that I would never pass up for anybody to be able to offer some 100% uh, legit insight on how to open those conversations between all of these just beautiful generations of men who that skill set was passed down to through the ages and how they can uh, encourage young women, young teens, because you got to talk teens in a very different way, um, to continue these traditions. Uh, and it all starts with, you know, uh, not, assuming not assuming that they're uh, delivery girls or uh, that their skill set is less than because, right. you know, they're looking like freaking Pamela Anderson. Yeah. They're not just bringing the tool to go to the truck to go deliver it to the shop. They're going to go home and use it. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So I got to change that mindset. Well, let's do that next time. And Chris, you guys work that out. Chris is the scheduling guru, so I'll let him do that part. But I, if you can and you have the time, please do come back because it, it would be beneficial for everybody, you know, now or a year from now to just start hearing this and understanding that what they're doing with the social machine can be somewhat changed in the way that they view it and the way that they comment on these things and the way that they approach creators and how they talk to them. Because some of the stuff you were telling us before the show, as far as the just the way that you get messages, it's like, what? Like, it just blows my mind, you know? I don't know if I've just been in a basement for a year. Well, that could be it. it, it no. we, we could literally have an entire dark side. I mean, uh, I've gotten to the point where the sugar daddy comments, but I ask him, I'm like, so are you going to buy me, uh, you know, uh, the festival? And they're like, oh, yeah, I'll buy you that on top of your uh, your allowance. I'm like, okay, will you buy me a new laser? It's like, I keep them going for almost a week now uh, of, of asking for stuff. 
Like, okay, in addition to my $3,000 a week, can I have all of the eighth inch ply that I want? Can I get, uh, you know, oh, this, this new hand crazy. planer? Uh, <laughs> and so they go and they go and they go. And then, then I'm like, all right, block. <laughs> block. That's it. All done. <laughs> all done. You, you've lost my interest. That's oh, great. Yep. So we'll do that next time. So thank you again, Jess thank Crow you. from Crow Creek Designs, the epoxy queen. And you posted that on your Instagram. That's why I'm saying it. Because I remember when you had a hard uh, time accepting that name. You know, uh, I, I do. I uh, That's, again, thank you. Thank you, social media. Somebody uh, stole that handle and uh, then was posting some. Um, somebody was using my name. And... Uh, <laughs> uh, Somebody was, oh, you guys, this, here, this is closing, right? Somebody yeah. stole my account, stole my name, not my official account. Somebody made a copycat account. And they named it uh, the Epoxy Queen and uh, then started messaging my followers. And uh, there was one guy, goodness gracious, bless his heart. He's like, uh, I, I paid $50 on your other account, but I didn't receive the pictures. I'm like, uh, what? what are you talking about? Like, did you buy my tutorial? I'm like, do you mean you spent $5 and bought the tutorials on my website? He's like, no, I paid $50 for those, those pictures that you can't sell on this one. So you had to make the second account. Uh, uh I'm sorry, but that wasn't me. And they're like, but it, it says Jess Crow, the epoxy queen. I'm like, um, okay. So here's the deal, dude. I'm sorry. And I'm grateful. Somebody made 50 bucks off of hopefully just like foot pics or something. But uh, <laughs> so I hate to say that is why I started embracing the epoxy queen handle was because somebody else found a back door way in. So I had to go and I snagged all of the, the names with that, with the exception of the, the Instagram handle that I can't get. Um, and uh, so I figured if people were going to think it was me, then they should probably actually legit think it was me. <laughs> Isn't that why there's that little check mark next to your name on Instagram? I don't it's have a, a check mark. Oh. I don't have a check mark. Instagram will not give me a check mark no matter how many times my account has been copied, stolen, people making money. I have all of this. Like if you Google my name, I am it. Like you're there, yeah. <laughs> Instagram will not give me a check mark. They don't wow. recognize Alaska. That's their issue. So I, I did add that moniker to it because I, I felt uh, if somebody was going to get paid for it, I have missed so many trains because of my pride and my ego that I would at least not miss this one. There you go. <laughs> awesome. Wow. Well, we do appreciate you coming on and we'll uh, definitely reach out and work out something for 22. I know, because we are about to enter that. So happy New yeah. Year, everybody! I get to. Am I the last show of the year? You are. You just, oh yeah. God, you guys decided to close out that show with a weird way. Well, we uh, ended it with a bang. To your viewers. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know what? We'll take it because you even said it yourself. You said whatnot earlier, and I was like, "That's exactly how this whole thing started." Was the whatnot? Yep. So All about the whatnot. Yep. Nice shop. Oh yeah. You got, yeah, this shop is just it, that, that, that's a whole nother conversation in itself too. So yeah, we could do a shop tour someday. We need to do a shop tour. This is my content creation station. <laughs> What's a con? Oh, that's where you just put everything up for pictures. Yes. Nice. Oh, I would not call it that, but we'll go with it. You sound much better. <laughs> well, thank you again for joining us and uh, we will do this again very soon. Ah, thanks, yeah, guys. Absolutely. And everybody watch it in here, and you'll have a great new year, and we'll see you next year. All right. See you guys. There's the everybody. outro. Thanks, Jess. Appreciate you. Ah, thank you, guys. Absolutely.